By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to talk about Elder Dragon Highlander old school style, of course. So that means we're building 100 card decks. Each card has a commander. And, you know, we're choosing our cards from the sets Alpha, Beta, Unlimited, the Four Horsemen sets, and Fallen Empires. And the cool thing is this is Color War. So we've each picked a color to play with. Now, I've picked the color blue. Here you can see all of our commanders, by the way. I've picked Sage of Latinam, so that's going to be my commander. Chris has picked Thrall Champion. Ishan has picked Chaos Adventure. And Marco has picked Argivian Archaeologist. Now, you're probably already thinking, wait a minute. These cards are not legendary. You cannot do that. Well, the cool thing is that uh, Xander, who's actually leading the commander format on Timmy Talks, he's made a special list of commanders that you can choose that are not necessarily legendary. So you can still play with all the legends, but just to spice it up a little bit, to give us a little bit more choices, he has made this really, really cool list that we're now going to experiment with. And I'm personally really looking forward to playing with my Sage of Latinam. I think it's a super cool commander because kind of drawing cards leads to more interaction in the game. So yeah, I'm really curious. And obviously I build the whole deck around it. Talking about that, we are going to start with the deck decks in a moment. Now, if you uh, would like to skip that section and go straight to the action, as always, you can check the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the game. Now, just a fair warning, it is a long game. <laughs> <laughs> this this really took so I understand if you're gonna watch this in 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 parts right so that's completely understandable but I can tell you it's a really cool game you're gonna see a lot of awesome cards and before we start actually with the deck text one last thing I want to share with you that if you want to know more about the specific rule sets that we followed again please check the description below because there I always add a, a little paragraph about uh, about the rules that we're following for this uh, for this episode. So here we are going to dive into the EDH decks and um, you know what, I'm actually just gonna start with my deck. Let's take a look at Latnam's College. And here we see my deck. So I've called this the College of Latnam. Obviously the commander is Sage of Latnam himself. It is a one, two creature and I can tap him to sacrifice an artifact and draw a card. Now I think this is just the coolest commander because I love card draw. And the cool thing is if my opponent is, for example, playing a Disenchant or a Shatter or a Crumble, whatever, on one of my artifacts in response, I can use my Sage, tap it to sack my artifact and draw a card. So then my opponent, uh, my opponent's artifact removal is gone and I'm actually getting a card in exchange for that. So that is pretty sweet, right? That is what we call card advantage. Now there are a couple of tricks with the Sage of Latinam in this deck and maybe it's Two of the most obvious here are Serpent Generator and the Hive. So these are token makers, but they make artifact creature tokens. So that means if I can tap them, for example, the Hive 5 and tap creates a 1-1 one, one flying artifact creature, I can, if I want to, sack that artifact creature to the Sage to basically draw a card. So that makes uh, the Hive kind of like an expensive gem day tome because you got to pay uh, 5 instead of 4. But still, it works. And this may sound really slow, but trust me, you'll see this EDH game, like any old school EDH game, it's going to take forever, so I've got time enough. So these clunky, like, synergies actually work. Um, talking about clunky, there is another trick here where we combine Taunus's Coffin with the Tetravis and the Sage of Latinam. So Tetravis is a 1-1 one, one flyer for 6 mana, but it comes into play with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. So it's basically a 4-4. Four, four. During your upkeep, you can take those counters off to make 1-1 one, one flyers, right? So I can take those counters off, make 3-1-1 one, one flyers, and then I can sack... Uh, one of the flyers to my sage because they're artifact creatures and then I get to draw a card with Taunus's coffin This is an artifact from the antiquities for four I can pay three and tap I can put a creature in the coffin in this case Tetravis During my next turn I can untap it the Tetravis comes back into play tapped But the ETB triggers go off again So that means in the case of Tetravis it comes back into play with three additional plus one plus one counters So in some kind of weird way I can create my own you know, drawing machine where the only limitation is that I have to tap Sage of Latinam so I can only do it once each turn. So it's going to be quite slow, but I mean, it is pretty cool and I can I can make it even better maybe. There are, well, not better, but there's another way of doing it where I actually use my Time Elemental, which is also in this deck. So Time Elemental, one blue and two for this Elemental from Legends. 
uh, two blue and two and tap return target permanent to your hand any permanent so it's going to be great but i can also target of course my own tetravis or trike then i can recast it and it comes into the battlefield with the etb trigger so i'm getting my counters back again so there there are there are some shenanigans like that in this deck talking about some shenanigans i'm just going to go through some of them because I, I can't discuss them all but maybe you can spot them um i've got nevenerals disc and hercules recall so the cool thing is that hercules recall is uh, one blue and one for a card from the antiquities that reads uh, target player returns all their artifacts back into their hand so target player so it can also be an opponent but it can also be myself when i use my nevenerals disc while the activation is still on the stack I can respond to it, to my own activation with my Hercules Recall, get all my artifacts back into safety, and then the disc explodes. But I still got all my stuff, you know? So that's gonna be great. And again, the cool thing about Hercules Recall is I can also use it against an opponent. So if for whatever reason my opponents have a, a lot of artifacts, I mean, we've got a deck here that plays um, um, the Argivian Archaeologist. We've got a deck here that plays the Avenger. So I, I think it's great to have this weapon. I think Hercules Recall could be pretty important um maybe just just for funsies I, i'll let you know about one other uh well it's not even a combo it's just some synergy i'm playing skull of arm so skull of arm is great if i can combine it for example with steel artifact and control magic these cards are super strong in the format so my opponent will, my opponents will probably destroy steel artifact and control magic as soon as it kind of hits the board and that's fine because with the skull i can get it back again it's super slow but this is EDH, you know, this is gonna take forever. I've got all the time I need. Um, you know what, okay, I'm gonna share one last one with you um, and th then I'm gonna stop, then we're gonna look at the, at the other deck. But another nice thing here is uh, a Field of Dreams together with Simbat. Field of Dreams means that everybody is playing with uh, the top card of their library uh, revealed. And then um, Simbat is a creature, one blue and one from the Arabian Nights expansion. And I can tap it and draw a card. If it's a land card, I can keep it. If not, I've got to discard it. Now, because of Field of Dreams, I will know when there's a land card at the top and I can use it. Now, this strategy is usually usually used together with Millstone. I couldn't really find a place for Millstone in here, but maybe, maybe I should have played it. Let me know in the comments if you would have played Millstone and if so, what card you would have taken out. Well, this is my deck. Um, if you want to pause, have a longer look please go for it. There are a lot more tricks that I haven't told you about. Maybe I can show it to you during the match. Let's now go um, to the deck of my opponents because I've got multiple opponents here. Let's actually go to the deck of Chris first, uh, the deck with the Thrall Champion. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Chris. Chris is a player from Germany and he's joining us today with a Thrall Champion deck. So um, I think that's really cool because Thralls are not you know, that great, especially in EDH, but it's really cool to see you play with it, Chris. I mean, it means you love the flavor of Thrall Champion, and I understand, it's, it's Fallen Empires is dripping with flavor. Let's take a look at this card. Thrall Champion, a 2-2 creature for one black and four, so that's five mana for a 2-2, but at least it's it does something useful. It says Thrall Creatures gets plus one, plus one, so that means it also pumps itself, so it's a 3-3. Three, three. Um, you can tap it to gain control of target Thrall for as long as you control the champion. So if you happen to play against somebody else with Thralls, you can steal them. That is pretty sweet. And I'm now thinking if I can actually control magic his Thrall Champion, I can steal his Thrall. That would be really mean. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not, but maybe I'm going to do it. <laughs> anyway, um, let's focus on the Thrall creatures, still, shall we? So um, there are a few creatures that maybe are worth mentioning. We've got Mindstep Thrall, which is a creature Thrall 2 2 that reads Whenever Mindstep Thrall attacks and isn't blocked, you may sacrifice it. If you do, defending player discards three cards. So, I mean, that's pretty heavy, right? When you lose three cards um, from, from one little Thrall creature. But then again, I think in EDH, since the games take that long, but I mean, who knows? Maybe it could be useful. Um, he's also playing with Necrite. Necrite is a 2-2 creature that also has this effect that when it isn't blocked, you can sacrifice it. And if you do, you can destroy target creature that of defending player. So it's kind of a terror on a stick. But then with the difference that you can destroy any creature so uh, of defending player of course but it's um it's nice i think it's cool and the art alone is worth adding it to the deck i mean isn't this just the most gruesome art you've ever seen uh, yeah i think it's it's beautiful and scary at the same time anyway um a card that i really want to talk about that's not even a thrall but it's connected to thralls is Eben Praetor. I think it's super cool. It's a 5-5 five, five creature for two black and four. The working title was Dark Judge, by the way, hence the art. 
because the name uh, the Ebon Crater didn't exist then, or at least wasn't known to the artist. The artist had the, a commission for a card called The Dark Judge. That's all he knew. So he kind of made a judge scene. Um, but anyway, that's maybe that's I could make a whole episode about this card. Maybe I will. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like an episode about Ebon Crater. But um, it's got First Strike and Trample, which is super unique in black, you know, having Trample on a card. Um, also, what it does, it reads, at the beginning of your upkeep, put a minus two, minus two counter on Ebon Praetor. Sacrifice a creature, remove a minus two, minus two counter from the Praetor. And here it comes, if the sacrifice creature was a thrall, put a plus one, plus O oh counter on Ebon Praetor. And you can only do this during your upkeep. So it's super weird. You get a minus two, minus two counter on it first. Then you can stack a creature. If it's a thrall, it gets a bonus. Now, maybe you're wondering, where am I going to get a thrall from? Well... That's where this card comes in handy, Breeding Pit. So Breeding Pit is one black and three to cast for an enchantment from Fallen Empires that reads, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice Breeding Pit unless you pay two black. At the beginning of your end step, create an 01 black Thrall creature token. So it creates Thrall tokens, and that's of course super good with Ebon Praetor, but there are a lot of other cards that it's really good with. What about Fallen Angel? Fallen Angel 3-3 three, three Flyer, you can sacrifice a creature and then it gets plus two, plus one. So again, really cool synergy. What about Soul Exchange? Two black to cast for Soul Exchange. You can sacrifice a creature and get target creature back from your graveyard. And if it's a thrall that you're sacking, and if you have Breeding Pit, it's going to be a thrall, it even gets a bonus. So it's a super good card. And also he's playing with Hell's Caretaker. Again, synergy, you know? So I'm really liking the synergy. I think I wouldn't be surprised if Chris has a Demonic Tutor, he uses the Demonic Tutor to find Breeding Pit. Breeding Pit opens so many gateways. The nice thing about Breeding Pit, by the way, is that they change the rules with tokens. If you sacrifice a token, it actually goes to the graveyard and then disappears. That means that I think you can use Soulnet for a life. I mean, I'm just going to check current uh, text on Soulnet because maybe it says uh non-token creature it does not it says whenever a creature dies you may pay one if you do you gain one life so you can use soul net every time you sacrifice one of your thralls to even net a life i mean that's just a lot of value you get a big creature back from the yard and you gain a life it is pretty epic i hope chris that you can manage to get breeding pit in play because that would just be super cool uh, a card that i'm a little bit scared of because i've actually won an edh match on it is Pestilence. Pestilence is super good because it deals one damage to every creature and every player. So that means if, you know, Chris is ahead on board, he can Pestilence all he wants. And I shouldn't say on board, but I mean, if he is ahead on life, he can, you know, he's playing mono black. He can like Pestilence for 10, who cares? Pestilence for 20, who cares? And he can win the game on the spot because then he's dealing damage to everybody at the table. Now, Pestilence destroys itself at the moment that there are no more, well, at the end of the turn, in which there are no more creatures in play. But guess what? Breeding Pit makes a token when? At the end of the turn. So Breeding Pit and Pestilence, it's great. It's really good. I really think that if you're Chris, what you want to do with this deck is cast your Breeding Pit. I mean, let me know, Chris, if, if I'm right or wrong, but I think it's really one of the key cards in your deck. There are a lot of different and other synergies in this deck. For example, you can do a lot with an IC Manipulator in here. Um, he's also playing Siphon Soul, which is just a great card in multiplayer. Maybe the first real multiplayer card that was ever uh, designed by WotC. So it's super cool. And also he's playing, of course, uh, Icy Royal Assassin. He's also playing uh, Sorcerer's Queen together with Transmutation. So I'm, I'm just seeing a lot of little combos here. Beautiful deck, Chris. Um, I'm going to leave the commentary here for what it is. But of course, I understand that, you know, maybe you just want to click pause and have some more time to look at this beautiful deck. Um, I think I'm going to go to the deck of Isha next, who's playing with Gaia's Adventure. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Ishan, and he is playing green, and his commander is Gaia's Adventure. And I think that's going to be a super good commander. Let's have a look at what the card does. Two green and one to cast for a 1-1 Gaia's Adventure from the Antiquities with asterisks below. Let's have a look at what those asterisks do. The asterisks below are the number of artifacts opponent has in play, or in this case, opponents have in play. So it's just going to count up all the artifacts on the board of the opponents, and then it's going to get a bonus for that. So each artifact gives it plus one, plus one. So if there are eight artifacts owned by the opponents, it's actually a 9-9. Nine, nine. So this Gaius Adventure can get out of hand really, really quickly. The only good thing, at least for us as opponents, is the fact that it doesn't have Trample. Now, when I'm looking at the rest of the deck, what I notice is that there are a lot of cards 
that can basically impact the entire board. So that's quite interesting. We've got, for example, Hurricane the Sorcery, but we also have If Biff Ifrit with the Build-In Hurricane mechanic. We also have Cyclone. So these are all cards that impact all of us. They impact the entire board. A card that is super fun in, in uh, old school multiplayer and in EDH, I've seen it experienced it once before in a match is the card Eureka. So I'm super happy Ishani you own this card and that you are playing this card. Two green and two for a sorcery from Legends that reads both players may take any permanent in their hand and put it directly into play. Players take turns playing one card from their hand until neither wants to play more permanents. So neither. So you can have a situation where let's say two out of the four players in this case say I don't want to play anything out anymore. But as long as other players are still going even if there's just one player left, that player can just play out all the permanents in their hand. It's fine, right? Uh, no other spells or effects of any kind may be used while Eureka is in effect. If a spell has an X in its casting cost, X equals zero. So yeah, I mean, if you if we get in Eureka early in the game, that's just going to be super fun. We're all just going to play out our big fatties and we'll just have to see what's going to happen. So again, um, you know, I think the cards in this deck, a lot of them impact the entire board. A card that I really like in this deck here is Living Lands, one green and three for an enchantment that reads treat all forest in play as one, one creatures. So this is kind of like a risky move play, right? If he's going to play Living Lands, he's probably going to do it at the end with maybe just one or two opponents left to kind of swing in and kill one of us. I think Living Lands can be a great finisher, but it's also, of course, super risky. You know, I, for example, am playing um, a Protocol Sorcerer. I know that uh, Chris is playing Kumbach Witches. So if you time your Living Lands wrong and, you know, your opponents can start killing your lands, which is obviously really, really bad. So it's a super tricky card, but I love the art and I think it's really cool to see it in your deck. And I think as a green Sorcerer, you kind of have to play with Living Lands, right? You, you have to, just like you've got a Force of Nature in your deck. These are just cards that you have to in include when you're playing Mono Green. Now, um, a card I want to kind of point out here, because the card may not seem that powerful, but it actually really is. It is Power Leech. Two green for an enchantment from Antiquities that reads, gain one life whenever one of the opponent's artifacts becomes tapped, or whenever the activation cost of one of the opponent's artifact is paid. is not triggered by continuous artifacts. So, for example... Uh, it's not triggered by a library of Lang. But, I mean, if you tap your Mox for mana, he's going to gain a life. If I attack him with one of my artifact creatures, he's going to gain a life. So Power Leech gets out of hand super, super quick. I know that from experience, it's a really good card. I think as, as when it hits the table, we have to try to get rid of it ASAP or else. I mean, his life gain is going to get out of hand. I'm pretty sure of that. Now, there's also... Uh, a classic combo here that I want to point out, and that's of course Lure with Thicket Basilisk, right? Thicket Basilisk is a 2-4 creature for 5 mana that reads, it destroys anything that it's blocked by or any, anything that it blocks. So if you put a Lure on Thicket, Lure is 2 green and 1 for an enchant creature that says all creatures able to block target creature must do so, right? So if I combine these two, and um, or I should say if, um, if Ishan combines these two and he attacks with his Thicket, his opponent has to block with all the creatures and they all die. And yeah, maybe the thicket dies as well. Who cares? But all the creatures of the opponent are then dead, uh, dead because of one thicket basilisk. And I think lure in general is a really good strategy in green because in green you usually have a lot of creatures. So you can just put your lure on a weaker creature, attack with your whole army, and your opponent can only block that one creature because of the lure and you can deal damage with all your other creatures. So that's actually really, really good. Um, another card that I'd like to point out, just because... It's got such cool art and you don't see it that often. It's a card Reincarnation, two green and one for an instant. If target creature is placed in a graveyard this turn, bring a creature from that graveyard directly into play under the control of the owner of the target creature. Treat this creature as though it were just summoned. So this is quite nice with, for example, a token strategy. We also see the Hive here uh, in the deck of, um, of Ishan. We also see, uh, of course, the card we discussed earlier, Living, Living Lands, that makes all your lands into 1-1 one, one creatures. So you just, you, you lose one of your 1-1s one, in combat, and then you kind of play this reincarnation when you say, you know what, um, this one's gonna die, but I'm going to get my, hmm, let's have a look, I get my If Biff back, or Force of Nature back, or Earn him back, you know, it's just a really cool card, and I mean, it is an instant, so it's usually coming out of nowhere, you don't see it often, so people don't really expect it. So that's going to be interesting. Overall, I think this deck is full of cards that impact the whole board, like I said before. And I think that's going to be the major role of the green player here. We haven't discussed a ton of these cards, like Drop of Honey, like Titania Song. So there are just still 
a lot of cards here in the deck that Living Plane is in here as well, that as soon as they hit the board, it changes the dynamics of the entire game. So green is looking risky from that point of view, but uh, definitely a beautiful deck, Ishan, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to battle against you today. And now let's take a look at the last deck, the deck by Marco. And here we see the deck of Marco. Now Marco is playing with one of my favorite cards in the game and that is the Argivian Archaeologist. I remember when I was young that I, uh, I saw this card for the first time. I was 12 and I was like, wow, this card is amazing. It can just get back artifacts from the yard. That is super, super strong. And you have to uh, understand that in those days you didn't see a lot of cards that weren't reprinted in later sets, right? So you know, antiquities cards like the archaeologist were, were just hard to actually see and find and, and know players that had those cards. They were super, super rare. So this card is two white and one for a 1-1 one, one summon archaeologist, two white and tap to bring one artifact from your graveyard back to your hand. And the nickname of this card is also the shirt because uh, he's wearing this khaki pants and it's almost like he's wearing no pants. So people would like kind of make jokes of the card and say that his, he was just the shirt and that he worked without any pants, kind of like an archaeologist hippie or something. So that was kind of funny, something I want to share with you. Now, obviously, the downside of this card is the fact that you need two white and tap to activate it and also two white to play it. So it's hard to splash in a strategy. And also, it is quite slow, right? Because you have to tap the archaeologist as well. So it's just a 1-1 one -one and your opponent has a whole turn to kind of find ways to deal with it. But if your opponent doesn't have an answer, this card is super good, especially in combination with Chaos Orb, right? Chaos Orb, of course, uh, two to cast. And, you know, the, the famous flip an orb card, uh, one pay, and then you flip the orb on any uh, non-token uh, permanent that you want to destroy. So it's uh, one of the best removal cards in, uh, in uh, the game of old school. And with the Archaeologist, you can keep getting it back and back and back. So that is, of course, super cool. And also he's playing with Rocket Launcher. That's another card. Basically, any card that destroys itself after its usage is really, really good with the Archaeologist, right? Because you can just get it back with the Archaeologist and play it over and over and over again. Now, what I like about the deck photo here of Marco is that it is super organized. We can kind of see the synergies in the deck photo. I don't really have to mention them, but I am. I'm going to mention a few. We see in the deck of Marco that he's basically doing the same as what I'm doing um, with my um, clockwork creature. So he's playing Taunus's Coffin and he can combine it with Tetravis, with Triskelion, with Clockwork Beast, with Clockwork Avian. So the same thing goes for all these creatures, right? You put them in the coffin, then you untap your coffin, they get out of the coffin and the, their counters double again. So for example, if you've got a Triskelion, it comes into play with three plus one plus one counters, so it's a four, four, you put it in the coffin, next turn you let it out in the coffin and it comes back as a uh, seven, seven, because it, it gets three additional plus one plus one counters. Now, what is important to note here is that when they come out of the coffin, uh, they are tapped, so they come back into play tapped. Okay, so that's a little bit of a downside. Um, looking at the rest of the deck, we see some more interesting synergies. For example, Island of Vakvak Vak in combination with Flying Carpet. Now, Island of Vakvak Vak is a card from uh, Arabian Nights. Super cool card. You can tap it and ta targets a flying creature's power is reduced to zero. So that's pretty nice. And of course, with Flying Carpet, you can give any creature flying. So let's say your opponent is attacking you with, let's talk about that Force of Nature again, with this giant 8-8 Force of Nature, and you have Island of Wak, Wak on board and Flying Carpet, you can give Force of Nature flying and then use Island of Wak, Wak to reduce its power to zero and take no damage. So I think this is a really cool uh, little synergy. Actually, Marco, I think I'm going to use this one for Forgotten Combos. I think it's really cool. Uh, and then we also see a combo that I've actually used in a Forgotten Combos episode, and that is Preacher and Diamond Valley, right? Preacher is a card from the dark. I can tap it, and then target opponent has to give me one of his creatures. So I get a creature. Maybe I don't like the creature, but that doesn't matter if I got Diamond Valley in play, because with Diamond Valley, I can tap Diamond Valley, sacrifice that creature, and then I gain life equal to the toughness. And then the next turn, when I untap my Preacher, I can ask my opponent, you know what? Give me another creature. I don't know where I left uh, the old one. It's gone. So that's, of course, uh, super cool. Some nice synergy as well, if needed, is, of course, Diamond Valley and Archaeologist. Let's say you're in dire need of life. You can just sack one of your artifact creatures, gain some life, and use your Archaeologist to get that creature back again and play it out again. So that is, is pretty sweet. We also see um, uh, Maze of If here in combination with Colossus of Sardia, which I think is super cool. Colossus of Sardia, a 9-9 trample creature for 9 to cast. 
Uh, and the thing is with Colossus of Sardia, during your upkeep, it doesn't untap during your untap step, I should say, and then during your upkeep, you can pay nine mana to have the Colossus untap again. Nine, so that's huge. But under new rules, you can actually use it in combination with Maze of If because you can attack and after damage is dealt, you're still in the uh, combat step. Then you can use your Maze of If, take your, um, your Colossus of Sardia out of combat and it untaps. So you can basically use the Maze of If to give Colossus of Sardia Vigilance, which is pretty good because you don't want to pay nine mana all the time. Uh, another combination here is Veteran Bodyguard and Force Field. So Veteran Bodyguard is a 2-5 creature that basically says all the damage you get out of combat is being soaked up by the Veteran Bodyguard. So let's say my opponent is attacking with a 5-5 Sheevan, then I'm taking 5 damage, but I'm not taking the damage if my Veteran Bodyguard is taking those 5 damage. Now, Veteran Bodyguard only has 5 toughness, so it's then going to die because it gets 5 damage, but not with... Uh, force field because with force field I can pay one and the damage I get is reduced to one instead of the actual damage So if I combine those two together I can kind of take in a lot of hits without actually taking any damage. So that's also a really good uh, Combination here and there, there are actually some more but I'll let you figure it out yourself I think Marco the way you set up uh, your deck photo is ideal for that because you've just laid out the cards together that work together really well so thank you for doing that and Maybe I'm going to do that next time as well. I kind of like it. It's, it's very organized. Overall, I think this is a really, really strong deck. I mean, if he can get his things going. I also like the land tech scene. What if he gets an early land tech? That would be insane, right? Um, I don't want to think about that. Anyway, uh, a really good deck. I'm loving the Archaeologist. We've discussed all the decks so far. That means we're ready. Let's go to this EDH match. I can't wait. And here we go, the game is off to a start here. I'm actually on the play and here you can see the commander. So I've got Sage of Latinam, Chris is second with his Thrall Champion. And then we've got Ishan with Gaia's Adventure third. And last but not least is Marco. He's actually at the top here with his Argivian Archaeologist. So I've just played an island and passed the turn to Chris here. Let's see what Chris can do in his opening turn. Playing a Swamp, so fair magic so far. No uh, crazy openers here. And a pass to Ishan. Ooh, this is good. Hollow tree. A storage land. That is really good. And look at that. I'm drawing a card. I'm thinking that it's my turn already. But sorry, Marco. Of course, first it's Marco's turn. And hollow tree, during the upkeep, it gets a counter if it's a stake tapped. And then at a certain point, you can choose to untap it and use all those counters for mana if you want to. But look at this opener by Marco. A land text turn one. That is insane. That is so not cool here, Marco playing that land tax. That is a big problem, and there is a Simbad from, uh, from my side here, so I do have a turn one play, but it's also going to activate the land tax. But what can I do? I mean, I cannot just not play out any lands in this multiplayer. There is a Kumbach, which is a problem for me, actually. It's a 1-3. You can tap it to deal one damage to any target, and then the person you target can also deal one damage back to Chris or to any of his creatures. And that means Chris can use the Kumbach Witches to, of course, kill my Simbad. I hope he's not going to do that. Ishani, you're playing a basic forest in the past turn. Marco choosing not to use the land tax, it seems, at least not for now. Playing a second land here, second land in turn two. And there is the Order of Lightbur, a 2-1 creature protection from black. And you can also pump it for two black, give it plus one, plus oh. And I'm going to play out something else, it seems. Okay, there's an Ao Pile. This is actually quite good. Ao Pile, an artifact from Fallen Empires. I can sack it and deal 2 damage to any target. So if Chris, for example, would target my Simbat with his Kumbach Witches, I can deal 1 damage back because of the Kumbach Witches to the Witches itself. And then I can use the Ao Pile to kill the Witches. So hopefully my Ao Pile um, is convincing Chris not to target my Simbat here. Chris uh, playing another Swamp. Let's see what he's going to play out. Oh, this is a mind step throw. So it's a 2-2 uh, summon throw. And when it attacks and if defending player doesn't block, he can choose to deal no damage and sacrifice the mind step throw, forcing that defending player to discard three cards. So that is pretty brutal. And a few players are still open. Actually, Ishan is the most open, but okay, not anymore, I guess. He's playing an Argovian Pixies, a 2-1 from the Antiquities expansion. And uh, here we see Marco and he is going to use 
his land tech. So he's going to find three lands here, three basics. So we're going to see three planes and then he's going to shuffle up again. So obviously, you know, having land techs in your opener is like the dream of, I guess, every person playing EDH or, or a singleton format for that matter. This is so good. It's probably the best card Marco could have played turn one in his entire deck. I mean, this is really gonna, gonna give him a big advantage compared to the rest of us. So he's playing a land drop number three, of course, and then he's gonna discard and pass turn. So he's gonna keep it open, and he's actually not attacking with this Order of Light Burr. And I'm playing a Felwer Stone here. So I'm just ramping up, tapping two, maybe playing out my commander. There, there, there it goes. Sage of Letnam. So the one two creature from the Antiquities expansion. I can tap it to sacrifice an artifact and draw a card. Four cards in hand and passing turn, it seems. It looks like Chris wants to use the witches, but decides not to. Of course, he could also choose to kill, for example, the Argovian Pixies on the side of Ishan and then attack him with the Mindset Throw. But I think Chris is like, well, if I target one opponent, then, you know, maybe I'll end up in a fight and it's so early in the game still. So I just want to wait and use my Kumbach, which is more defensively. Ooh, an Hypnotic Spectre. 2-2 two -two Flyer, of course, that attacks and when it's not blocked, the person that it's attacking has to discard a card at random. So that is huge. So I wonder if, if any of the players are going to do anything against the Hippie. Here we see, I believe it's called the Gaia's Blessing. It means that you can play an additional forest each turn. And Ishan is doing that, playing two forests here. Which is really nice for him. But it's also nice for Marco. Because he's seeing, oh, they're playing out even more lands. And he's taking three lands out of his deck again. So this is just a huge advantage here for Marco. And of course, uh, you know, the rest of the table is not happy. But it's really difficult to deal with in Shamans uh, for us at the moment. Like blue, you really have to counter it. If you can't counter it, it's probably going to stick. Black, it's really difficult to deal with in Shaman. It's only green, and green is Tranquility. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's here to stay, I'm afraid. And Marco, you're playing out land number four. Tapping four mana. What is he going to cast? Ooh, a living wall. That is so cool. It's an 06 creature uh, that has pay one regenerate. Now, you don't see this card often. I've always loved the art. And it's one of the cards I actually used to play with a lot uh, when I started playing Magic. I was a big fan of regeneration. And now I'm taking my turn. Tapping four mana here. Nope, tapping three instead. What am I going to cast? Ooh, an Apprentice Wizard. So Apprentice Wizard is, I believe, an 0-1 creature. And you can pay one blue and tap it, and it makes three generic mana. So it's, 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 it's a nice tempo play. So maybe next turn I can play out something big. Who knows? And I still have that AO pile. I mean, if I lose the AO pile for any other reason, I'm sure Chris is going to start killing my little Simbat and Apprentice Wizard. So we cannot have that happen. But I'm still a little bit nervous about it. Let's see if Chris is going to attack. He is going to attack with the Hippie. And I believe he's attacking Ishan right now. And there we see a response by Ishan. And he's going to cast the Crumble. Wow. And, oh, and actually he's targeting my AO pile. So he's saying, I'm targeting your AO pile. You can respond. Oh, this is bad news for me. So I'm using the AO pile here to destroy the Hypnotic Spectre. Very good play by Ishan. I have to admit that. Very good play indeed, because he's forcing me to destroy that Hypnotic Spectre. The problem here is that now Chris can just use the Kumbach Witches. It looks like he's just using his turn to play a Sorcerer's Queen and a pass. So I'm very lucky here that Chris chooses not to kill my creatures. And Ishan playing out some more lands here. I wonder if he wants to play the Adventure already. I mean, it will be a 3-3, three, three, I believe, because I have an artifact and Marco has an artifact, and it's a 1-1 one, one from itself, so then it would be a 3-3 three, three creature. Marco here again picking uh, Lance. Three basics, and he's shuffling up again. So I've got four cards in hand at the moment. 
There's, of course, another planes. That's not the problem for Marco. He's got lands enough. What is he going to do? He's going to tap four. And, okay, there is a rocket launcher. So, rocket launcher card from the Antiquities. You can pay two to deal one damage to any target. And you can do that multiple times as long as you've got the mana for it because you don't have to tap it. But then it destroys itself at the beginning of the next end step. It actually is pretty good with the table. I mean, with Lantex, he's got more than enough lands. And then there are so many weenie creatures on the board right now. It could be really, really good later in the game. Anyway, I'm using my Apprentice Wizard here for three mana. Tapping two more mana. So I've got five mana to spend here. Ooh, six mana that is. And I'm playing a Clockwork Beast. So Clockwork Beast is an 0-4 creature that comes onto the battlefield with seven plus one plus O counters, making it a 7-4. So that is pretty big. So 7-4. And what I can do, of course, is I, if I attack, for example, Chris, and he uses his Sorcerer's Queen, he can only make the base stats into an 0-2. So that means I still have a 7-2 creature. It looks like Chris had just passed turn, by the way. So it looks like he's stuck on those three lands. That is really bad news for Chris. There we see a strip mine by Ishan. I don't really think there's a good target for him at the moment. Yeah, perhaps it would have been better for him not to play out that strip mine. Because then Marco couldn't have activated his land tax again. And uh, Marco now shuffling up again, of course, picking his lands because of the land tax. And this is really giving Marco a big advantage compared to the rest of us. Especially compared to Chris, who has now missed, I believe, two land drops already. That's pretty huge. So Marco here playing land number six. I wonder what else he's going to do. Tapping three whites. And oh, there's a Jalem Tome. And the cool thing about this Jalem Tome is it has the Timmy Talks logo on there and also my face, <laughs> which is funny to see my card on the face. But he's also a graphic artist and um, he's, he, he knows what to do with the printing machine. So he printed it out, put it on a sleeve like the, um, the Timmy Talks logo and, and my face. And he put that then over the card. So it's kind of an art sleeve, you could say. Anyway, uh, he passed the turn to me, so I'm going to untap. I wonder if I'm going to attack with my Clockwork Beast here. All of us are still on 30, because we decided to start with 30 instead of 40, because these, these EDH games, they can take really, really long, trust me. So 30 is more than enough. You don't need 40 life. Tapping, making 3. Tapping some more mana. 5 mana in total. Ooh, there's a Ring of Renewal. This is pretty good. Card from Fallen Empires. Five and tap, discard a card at random and draw two cards. The cool thing is if your hand's empty, you can simply just draw two cards. Look, looks like I'm attacking here with my Clockwork Beast, attacking Chris. So I'm basically offering Chris a trade here, I guess. Don't really think this is a good attack, but I, I think I just want to do something here on the board. So he's going to make it into a 7-2, then blocking it with the Mind Step Throw. So we're... Exchanging the Thrall for the Clockwork Beast. Not really sure if this is a good decision. But uh, it's basically the only person I could attack with my huge Clockwork Beast. And I wonder if, if Chris... Oh, I'm still, I'm still on my turn. Looks like I'm playing a Jalem Tome in my second main. And now I'm passing the turn to Chris. So what I wanted to say is I wonder if Chris is going to use those Kumbach uh, uh, Witches sooner or later... I mean, I just attacked him. It looks like he isn't, though, and he's just passing turn. Again, no land drop for Chris. This is very unfortunate. When you play this game, you just want to find lands and you want to join in. And it looks like Ishan is paying three. Is he actually going to cast his Gaia's Adventure? Yes, he's going to play out his Gaia's Adventure, which is now... I've got three artifacts and Marco's got three, so it's now actually a 7-7. Seven, seven. So it's a 1-1 one, one, and it gets a bonus for every artifact in play. So it is now a 7-7. Seven, seven. That is pretty big. So a 7-7 seven, seven on the field. 
And then probably just the past turn. There's not really a, a good opponent to attack with that Targovian Pixies. Four cards in hand, and there's a pass turn. Marco untapping again, and again he can use the land tax. Because Ishan's got seven lands in total, and Marco only six at the moment. I've got six lands as well, by the way, and of course Chris is really behind here on just three lands. He's missed so many land drops already. There we see Marco shuffling up. And of course, drawing a card for turn as well. Yeah, there he goes. He's probably going to play land number seven. And then I wonder what he's going to do next. Remember that Rocket Launcher is getting better and better as well. I mean, there's no reason to use it now, of course. Ooh, Spirit Link. Playing a Spirit Link here on the Gaia's Adventure. That is sick. Man. That is a good move because now Ishan can just attack other opponents and then Marco will gain 7 life if it, if it actually deals any damage also to, to creatures. So this is perfect and this is bad news for Ishan. I mean, we talked about enchantments earlier with the land decks. It's really difficult for these decks to get rid of, of, uh, of enchantments. So uh, yeah, that's a spirit linked Gaia's Adventure. And is Marco going to do anything else? He's got the Jalen Tome, of course, to use if he wants to. I don't think he's played a land for turn yet. But maybe he doesn't want to so that he can still keep his land tax active. Tapping three, going to use his Jalen Tome, drawing a card, probably going to discard a land, exactly. So Jalen Tome and land tax, another really nice combination. Discarding even more lands on passing turns, so no land drop from him. Sacrificing a Felwer Stone to draw a card. And untapping. So I'm doing that on end step, Marco's end step. So untapping my lands. I mean, I've got the Ring of Renewal and the Jalem Tome. I've got three cards in hand, so... Oh, and there we see Marco's actually saying, I forgot to play out a land, can I still play out my land? And we said, yeah, sure, man, no worries. We're playing super laid back, of course. So two cards in hand. And gonna make three mana with my Apprentice Wizard. Four mana. Ooh, Grape Shot Catapult. So that's a card from Antiquities. Two, three creature. And I can tap it to deal one damage to any flying creature. I want to say to any target, but that's not true. Only to flying creatures. Using my Jalem here to discard a card and draw a card. Discarding my Ursus Tower. So I am playing with one copy of Earth's Tower, Power Plant, and um, uh, Mine. And Chris again. Oh, he's found a land, though. There's a Maze of If, so that's something at least for him. And I'm passing turn to Ishan. So that Maze of If is pretty good. It can protect him from the, uh, from the Gaia's Avenger, although he already has that uh, Sorcerer's Queen that can do that as well. There is a forest by Ishan. And he's pointing at the adventure. He wants to attack, but he knows he can't. Well, no, he can't, right? Okay. For a moment there, I thought he wanted to attack, but he's saying, you know, I don't want to give life to Marco. I mean, he could attack me. I'm pretty open, actually. But that would mean basically giving seven life to Marco as well. And Marco currently is the best... best um, Best player, he's got the best setup at the moment. And there's the pass turn. And um, yeah, of course, Marco here using his land tax again. Makes sense. Only two, oh, he is choosing three lands this time. Looked for a moment that he was only going for two. He is shuffling up. And let's see what else he is going to do. I must say, I think the Living Wall is doing a lot of work for Marco here. It's difficult to touch him. I think if I can maybe find one of my bigger flyers, I can start attacking him. Because it is kind of getting out of hand. His order is getting much better as well with all the mana. And that uh, Rocket Launcher is looking better and better. And 
And, ooh, Marco's gonna attack here using his Order of Light Burn. He's actually attacking me. The thing is, if he attacks Chris, Chris can just use his Maze of If. So I guess I am the best target. What am I going to do here? If I let it go, I mean, I'm still on 30. He's just gonna deal a ton of damage, but that's not the biggest problem. The thing is, he can also give it first strike. So if I block it with the 1-1, let's say my Simbad. On the other hand, he could also chump it because Chris has at Kumbach Witches. So I don't know how long it's going to live anyway. Yeah, it looks like I'm just going to chump block it. He's probably going to give it first strike here so it doesn't die. Yeah, that's exactly what he does. Makes sense. The question now is, is Marco going to do anything else? I think he should have untapped the Jalum Tome, by the way. He hasn't used it yet, right? Maybe I didn't see him using it. Okay, and now he's playing out. Ooh, he's playing out a Jam Day Tome. Yeah, so he's untapping the Jalem. Forgot to do that earlier. But this is really good, the Jam Day Tome in combination with all the lands. I mean, Marco is looking more and more scary, actually. And of course, the Gaze Avenger gets a little bit bigger every time a new artifact hits the board. Two cards in hand at the moment. Making three mana, making six mana. What am I going to play? Ooh, Book of Rass. For a moment there, I thought it was going to cast a Mahamoti Jin playing a Book of Rass. So I've got a Jalum Tome, a book, and a ring to draw cards, but I'm not really using it. The problem for me is that I don't really have... Okay, now I'm using my Book of Rass for the first time. So Book of Rass is paid two and two life to draw cards. I'm going to 28. Finding my land drop for turn so I can use it again. So I'm going to go to 26. Two cards in hand. I wonder if this is the right strategy because I could have chosen to kind of first empty my hand and then just simply use my Ring of Renewal to draw two cards for five mana. I think maybe that would have been a, diff a better strategy. But, you know, I guess I was eager. Making some more space. Passing the turn to Chris here. And Chris is playing a Soul Net. But what Chris really wants and needs is more Swamps. So Soul Net, pretty good an artifact. Every time a creature dies, you can pay one and then you gain a life. There we see... Oh, Desert Twister. By Ishan here, playing a Desert Twister. And I think he's targeting the Spirit Link. So he's going to get rid of the Spirit Link. And that means that his uh, Gaius Adventure is operational. This is bad news for me. I mean, I'm the only player that really has no defenses. I mean, I've got a Sage of Letnam, a Tapped Apprentice Wizard, and a Grape Shot Catapult. And wow, Strip Mine on the Maze, and he's actually attacking Chris here. So Chris can, I believe, make it into an O2. I think that is going to work. And yeah, actually it does. So I think that's something that Ishan overlooked. He did use the strip to take care of the maze. But then the Sorcerer's Queen worked. It does mean that Chris is kind of open now without that maze of it. So hopefully Marco is going to use his Order of Light Burr against Chris. And he's not going to attack me again. I mean, for, for me now with the Book of Rest, two life equals a card, right? So I'm just hoping not to take any damage. It also means, by the way, that Marco can no longer activate his land tax. I mean, I'm, I, I think he's used it often enough, so it doesn't really matter, but still. He is tapping five here. What is he going to cast? Ooh, Gauntlet of Chaos. That is sweet. So he can use his Gauntlet of Chaos to trade a creature and an artifact if he wants to. So he could actually use his gauntlet to get the uh, gay as a venture. Wow. That would be something special. Not attacking with the Order of Light Burr, by the way. And I'm just taking my turn now. Untapping, drawing a card. What am I playing there? Okay, I'm playing a Maze of If of my own. Okay, that is good news because he hardly had any defenses. Really happy with that. And, oh, I'm going to use my book again. I think I should just use my Jalem Tome. Going to 24 here, three cards in hand. I wonder what cards I have because I've got more than enough mana to just play stuff out. Maybe counter spells. Could be. I'm playing with Power Sync, Spell Blast, and Counter Spell and Mana Drain. 
Ooh, there's a sinkhole. Is it going to be on my maze? Oh, that's bad. That is really bad. Now I've opened up again. Oh man, this is bad news. I can feel pain coming in the turns to come. So Ishan untapping here. 11 storage counters on this hollow tree, by the way. And it looks like his tree, his gaze adventure has grown to a 11-11. Or no, to a 10-10 actually. Oh, there's Power Leech. So Power Leech means that Ishan now gains one life every time anybody, any opponent uses an artifact, taps an artifact or pays for the activation cost. That is, Power Leech is so good in this, uh, in this board. Aspect of Wolf on the Pixies. So he's kind of dividing his creatures. So the Aspect of Wolves gives plus one, plus one per two forests that you have. So he's got six forests. So he got plus three, plus three. So it's now a five, four. And it looks like Chris has responded to that Aspect of Wolf by using a Kumbach Witches. Killing it. And Ishan is actually not killing the... Um, the Sorcerer's Queen. That's what I expected him to do, to be honest. But Ishan just chooses to deal one damage to Chris. Or not, actually. He's still in the tank. He hasn't made a decision yet. Chris gained a life because of the Soul Net. And yeah, it looks like he is going to kill the Sorcerer's Queen. And in, in return, he's going to maybe make the Gaze Adventure into an O2 creature. So there's quite a lot happening right now. And this is, of course, good news for, uh, well, for the rest of the table. Really happy to see the Sorcerer's Queen go. And I wonder if Ishan, I guess he's just going to pass turn because his Gaze Adventure is now turned into an O2 by Chris. And Chris having three cards in hand, at the, or Ishan having three cards in hand at the moment. He's probably just going to pass to Marco here. So Marco counting his lands, trying to find out if there's still a land tax activation. I think I actually have the most lands after Marco. I've got eight lands, Ishan seven, Chris only three still. And Marco also has eight lands. I wonder if he's going to use the Gauntlet of Might. If he uses it on the uh, Gaius Adventure, it does mean that the Gaius Adventure will shrink in size. Yeah, he's going to use the Gauntlet of Chaos. Oh, <laughs> and he's going to steal the. Gaius Adventure from Ishan is going to trade it. That is pretty sick. That is pretty sick. But of course, his adventure is smaller because Ishan is no artifacts. Chris only one, and I've got four artifacts. So it's still, it gets a bonus of plus five, plus five. So it's still a six, six, which is not too bad. But oh man, this is, it's just so cool. Gauntlet of Chaos, super fun, of course, in this multiplayer setting. A card from Legends. So it is now a 6-6. Six, six. I wonder if, if, if it really makes a big difference, though. It's kind of trying to find a token. Because this is nice to know. Gauntlet of Chaos is not removed from the game after you use it. It actually goes to your graveyard. So that is pretty sweet. So here we see Marco playing a 6-6. Six, six. And it looks like he wants to pass turn. So I want to do a few things in the end step. Probably going to use my Jalem Tome. Looks like Marco still wants to do something, playing a disenchant. What is he going to disenchant? 
I hope the power leech. There's a response by Ishan though. Oh, avoid fate. Oh, <laughs> sweet move. Saving the power leech from destruction by playing the avoid fate. Wow. And this yellow card, by the way, that Ishan is playing is representing the Order of Lightbur on his side of the table. And I'm using my Jalem Tome end step, discarding a, uh, an island. I wonder what I'm going to do here. I've got two, four, yeah, six, still eight islands open. I've got so much mana also because of the Apprentice Wizard. So it looks like I'm using the Apprentice for three. There's a Basalt Monolith. I'm not playing with Power Artifact, by the way, in this deck. I think I should have. For some reason, I just forgot about it. I wonder if I'm going to use my Ring of Renewal anytime soon. Paying four. Okay, playing a clone. And I think I'm going to clone the Gaius Adventure here. <laughs> That's so funny. And the, the Gaius Adventure is then going to be, because Marco has four artifacts, Chris has one, so it's going to be a 6-6. Six, six. Could have decided to also copy the Kumbach Witches, perhaps. Because with that, I could have killed the Order of Lightbur. And I've got some more pingers in the deck. But on the other hand, I mean, you know, it's just so cool to have your own Gaius adventure. So there it is with the dice on it. Passing turn to Chris. Hoping for Chris that he can finally find some lands and really join in on this game. It looks like he's just passing turn though to Ishan. Look at that hollow tree of Ishan. That is scary as well. Like if he gets like a hurricane or something... You can just deal a lot of damage out of nowhere. And he is already on 32, Ishana. With a power leech, that's going to go up very, very rapidly. That's definitely something to keep an eye on. He's going to attack here. Order of Lightbearer, and I believe he's attacking Chris. So he deals 2 damage to Chris, so he's going to drop to 29. 3 cards in hand, and it looks like he's passing turn. I think at least he's passing turn. And we see Marco again counting the land, saying I've got 8 lands. Oh, Ishan is checking if he can play out a land without activating the land tax. Now I get it. Good job, Ishan, to think about that before playing out your land. That's smart and pass it turn you to Marco. So Marco still cannot use the land tax. But then again, I think he's had his fair share and fair advantage of the land tax already. What a broken card. And Marco, actually Marco's position is still really, really good. With the Jalem Tome and the Jamde Tome and with the Living living Wall to stop everything. He's now attacking with the Gaius Avenger. And he's, I believe he's attacking Ishan here. So Ishan has taken the damage. Seven points of damage. And he is dropping to 25. So Ishan getting attacked by his own Gaius Avenger. That is brutal. There we see a tap, four manas. What are we gonna get? I see Manipulator, ooh. Marco's board is really scary. I mean, I'm not doing anything against it. I'm just getting an extra counter. Oh man. So I've got eight lands here, and of course that Basil Monolith, and I have my, appren I'm my Apprentice Wizard. The problem here, I believe, is really Marco's side of the board. It's so overpowered. I need to do something against it. I 
It looks like I'm using the Jalum Tome to draw a card and then discard a card. Discarding a Mishra's Workshop. Tapping the Monolith. Okay, there's a Relic Barrier. Relic Barrier, really good against an Icy Manipulator. So Relic Barrier can tap target artifact by tapping it itself. Only two mana to cast and no mana to activate. A card from Legends. I wonder if I'm actually going to attack anybody with my Gaius Avenger. It looks like I'm thinking about it. Ooh, there's a little glitch on the side of Chris, but luckily he's back. I mean, Chris is a very tempting target to just attack with the Gaius Avenger. Ishan is as well, by the way. Ishan is, uh, has got his Order of Light Bird tapped. Marco is going to be quite tough to attack because he's got the Living Wall. He's got the Icy Manipulator. So I wonder what I'm going to do here. And okay, it looks like I'm going to throw a dice to decide who I'm going to attack. One and two is going to be Chris, three and four Ishan, and five and six is going to be Marco. But if I attack Marco, it's going to be pretty useless. There's a five, so I guess I'm going to attack Marco here. He can, just, he can do multiple things. I mean, he can block on the Living Wall for starters. Regenerate the wall exactly is what he does, so no damage for him and uh, no defender for me. I mean, I could have used my relic barrier, I guess, but maybe I want to use that on the end step of Marco here. So it looks like that's all that I'm doing, really, and passing the turn to Chris. So let's hope for Chris that he can finally find some lands and really, you know, become a part of this match. The only good thing for Chris here is that he's still on 29, despite the fact that he's. You know, he hasn't been really able to play out much because of his, uh, his lands. Only three lands for Chris. Looks like he's kind of looking around. Tapping two. Ooh, Spirit Shackles. That is pretty interesting. What is he going to play the Spirit Shackles on? I think he's going to target Marco's Gay as a venture. That kind of makes sense. Marco's really in the driver's seat in this matchup so far. So that Spirit Shackles is targeting the Gaius Avenger of Marco. So Marco, they're using, I think they're a little blue dice to indicating it. So Spirit Shackles is a card that whenever the creature it enchants becomes stepped, it gets minus um, O and minus 2. So if we can find a way to tap it down, like have an Icy, for example, we can very slowly kill it. Ooh, it looks like Ishan is going to use the mana from his ho Hollow Tree. He has untapped it. He's got 12 mana on there. That's huge. Are we going to see a ridiculous turn here from Ishan? That is the question at the moment. Tapping four forests to start with. What is he? Oh, there's an Icy Manipulator. So now he can use the Icy to tap down the Gaius Adventure of Marco, slowly killing him. If Marco is now smart, I guess he can use his own IC to tap the IC of Ishan. There we see an attack with the Order of Light Burr onto Chris. So Chris is uh, dropping two lives, going to 27. Marco, of course, still on 30. And there's the pass. So Marco here untapping, not using his Icy Manipulator. So, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing possibilities for Ishan here. He could start tapping down Marco's Gaius Adventure, slowly killing it, and then it comes back into Ishan's command zone. Because remember, his Gaius Adventure is actually uh, Ishan's. Marco stole it with the Gauntlets of Chaos a while ago. It's quite funny, actually. I have a Gaius Avenger, Marco has a Gaius Avenger, and Ishan, who's playing with Gaius Avenger, doesn't have a Gaius Avenger. Oh, that's so funny. It looks like he wants to attack right now with his own Avenger. And then, of course, Ishan can respond. Is he going to or not? Yes, he is. So he's going to tap it down. That means Spirit Shackles get activated and there is a minus O, minus 2 counter being placed on the Gaze Avenger. So the Gaze Avenger right now is, I believe, a 9-9. So it's now a 9-7. I mean, it's going to take a long time before it dies. Exactly. So 
Marco's going to use more dice to kind of indicate the power toughness situation. So I guess it's now a 9-6 for some reason. I thought it would be a 9-7. Tapping three. Ooh, there's an angry mob. An angry, angry mob. When it attacks, it gets a bonus for all swamps that the uh, opponent that it attacks controls. So it's really a card that can target Chris here. If it attacks Chris, it's actually a 5-5 five five instead of a 2-2. Two two. An angry mob also has trample. So using counties here to show the bonuses. Passing turn on N7 using my Relic Bearer, tapping down his Icy. And then of course Marco can, can respond if he wants to. I mean, I feel for me Marco really is the target now. He's just so strong and also with the Jam Day Tome and everything that he has. I'm also untapping, it, it looks like my Basalt Monolith, so... Untapping everything here. Forgetting to untap my Gaze Adventure, I still need to do that. It also untaps. Tapping four mana. Casting a book, look at all that. I've got the Gem Day Tome, the Jalem Tome, the Book of Rats. I got a whole library over there. It's ridiculous. And it looks like I'm gonna sack my Jalem Tome. Don't really need it anymore. I'm gonna draw a card. Again, not quite sure if that's the best decision to make. But okay. Maybe I'm looking for something. I've got quite a lot of strong cards in my deck. You know, maybe at this point, I just want to cast a Nevenerals Disc and wipe the board because it's just crazy. It looks like I'm going to attack somebody with my 2-3. I'm going to attack Ishan here, so he's going to take 2 damage. But he also gains a life from the Power Leech. So, I mean, <laughs> it's not really solving anything. I'm keeping my uh, Gaia's Adventure at bay, by the way. Passing turn here to Chris. Ooh, Chris finding mana. Now, that's something. A storage land, no less. So, hopefully, this can help Chris later down the line. Who knows? Maybe he can play like a huge Drain Life and win the game out of nowhere. I mean, who knows? Or a huge pestilence or something. I mean, weirder things have happened in these multiplayer games. And for some reason, I'm untapping my Sage. I should not untap my Sage. I've used my Sage. Hopefully someone is going to correct me. Because I've used it to sack my Jalem Tome to draw a card. Exactly. Good. That's good. I think one of the other players said, no, it should be tapped because you use it for the Tome. And that's, of course, correct. So three cards in hand for Ishan. Is he again going to attack Chris with the Order of Lightbird? That is an option. No, he's not going to do it. Passing turn here to Marco. Marco untapping. He's going to use some other dice to show the power and toughness. It's kind of hard to see, actually, Marco, but you know what? I believe you. It's probably just going to work out. I wonder if Ishan's going to tap down the uh, Gaia's Adventure again. Uh, again, perhaps Marco and Ishan can make a deal. I hope not, of course, because that would probably mean that Marco's going to use his Adventure against me or Chris. I think Marco wants to attack here again. Is he also going to attack with the angry mob? And there we see Ishan again tapping down the Gaze Adventure. Gaze Adventure going to go down. It looks like he's got four toughness now. Wow, so only two more turns and then it's actually dead. I wonder if Marco's going to use his angry mob to attack Chris here. 5-5 five, five Trampler would be pretty problematic for Chris. And the life totals are still really, really high, by the way. It's, it's kind of insane. Marco's still on 30. Ishan, of course, he's, he's on 30 and he's got the Power Leech. Ooh, there we see him using his Icy Manipulator to tap down... My Gaia's Avenger, that is interesting. 
Why would he do that? Because next turn I can untap it anyway. And now I can target something else with my Relic Barrier. For example, the Living Wall. It looks like maybe he's attacking me here with his Angry Mob. And okay, I'm trying to find a solution here. First, activating my Jam Day Tome. That means one more life for Ishan. Yep, taking five damage from the Angry Mob. That's exactly... Uh, what Marco wanted to do here, but now he's kind of allowing me to use my Relic Barrier to maybe tap down his Living Wall and kind of opening it up. That would be kind of sweet, right? I can tap down his Living Wall and then attack him with Gaia's Avenger. That would be pretty good. Is Marco doing something else? Tapping four and he's casting. Ooh, that is super annoying. Adonis' coffin and Marco's board state keeps getting better and better and better and better. I am tapping it down in end step. I wonder what I'm going to do when it's my turn. Okay, so this was part one. And uh, this is going to be a two-part series because, yeah, this is just insane. We, we're all still on a pretty high life total. I don't know where the game is going. I have no idea. Did you see the board state of Marco? How am I ever going to defeat that guy? I have no idea. We need something like a board wipe. I think an Evernerl disc is probably best. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed part one. If you want to see part number two, wait, there we are, part number two, please uh, check us out again uh, on Friday because then I will post part number two of this epic EDH color battle and uh, if you're looking back at this video, I'll probably have a link popping up uh, showing you where to go if you want to see part number two right now. And uh, yeah, I mean, what a game. What a game. Insane. Before you go, uh, please take a moment to like, uh, subscribe, and uh, maybe comment, share, all that stuff. Really, really helps. And I also have my own Patreon. So if you want to support me to continue doing what I'm doing, um, please consider becoming a patron. I would really, really appreciate it. Check out uh, patreon.com slash timmytalks to find out how to do it and what the perks are. One of the perks are um, that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Somebody can see.